before we begin. So for subscribers, you know, I don't write cases for y'all, but I do write this hour long script that could be used as a basis for some cases if you want. So I'm going to upload it to the website. If you find it useful, let me know. I'll keep doing it. For our boss subscription plan, fantastic plan. You get all of the other things, plus uh, access to PF Essentials course, the internet's most complete PF guide. You can really learn PF at a theory level. Uh, great program, very cheap, uh, not a great name. So I'm changing it to Solo, which kind of more accurately reflects what it is, a self-guided course for learning PF. I'm introducing another level, Team, specifically designed for teams of two without adequate coaching. So I'm specifically in interested in teams that one, are willing to work independently, two, lack adequate coaching. So I do not want to coach casuals nor do I want to coach very advanced students. Coaching will mostly be asynchronous and will include drill assignments, case reviews, weekly practice rounds, etc. The goal of this coaching is to make you better at debate. It is not to fill up a two hour pre-scheduled block every Tuesday night. If you want typical lectures, well, here they are on YouTube for free. This plan will start at $200 a month as I work out the kinks. It may increase later. That price is per team of two not team of one, not team of three. Please review the terms before buying. And again, if you're interested in traditional case uh, classes for a group of 12 or more, send me an email. Classes will be remote unless you're in Dayton. Shout out to Springboro, go Panthers. On tournaments, let re me recommend, as always, North American Debate. Sign up for public forum tournaments without silly rules and with cash prizes. If you do NSDA tournaments and you like to win, you should supplement with NAD. And if you're not yet actively debating, NAD should be your first stop. There is a link in the description below. Again, remember that all quotes read in this lecture are cut and may appear differently from how they're originally written. The cards are all available in the debate track brief at debatetrack.com. Lastly, today's art style is futuristic Japanese synthwave art. Comment below what art style should be next. Should we do crayon drawings, one line drawings, macro photographs, Fernando Botero, you choose. Let's talk about the definition, the topic. By the time I finished researching this topic, making an 80 page brief and rebuttal sheet, writing this video, filming the video, editing the video, uploading the video, a process that all takes two-ish weeks now that I have a full-time job, there is a very decent chance they will have changed the topic if recent history is any guide or they'll change the topic as soon as it's released with my luck. So please check the description below for any updates, just in case. In any case, here's your resolution as of when I wrote this. The US federal government should ban the collection of personal data through biometric recognition technology. So if uniqueness was the big concept for Artemis Accords, topicality is the big concept for biometrics, Almost everything biometric related is pretty unique, but in other words, we're really trying to figure out like what exactly are we supposed to be debating about? So let's begin with some simple definitions and then I will discuss again my simplest reading of the resolution, which I will use to guide this lecture, followed by a discussion of the many less simple readings. A ban, of course, means that the technologies in question will no longer be allowed under federal rules, meaning that their use will be off limits in the United States. This does not mean biometrics won't be used at all. After all, marijuana, for example, is legal under federal law, uh, yet freely and openly used in states where it's legal. So banning biometrics isn't the same as enforcing the ban, uh, but they're pretty much tied together. If AF wanted to argue that the federal ban should be in place, whether the federal government should not enforce it, that would be a wild interpretation of the resolution. Probably don't argue that. Next collection. The connotation of this word in the context of other tech regulation is the collection by companies and or the government sucked up into private servers where the info can be analyzed and used for ends both devious and otherwise. I think this definition is the most reasonable for the debate, but does require some interpretation. On a technology level, it probably means something much more simple, like data needs to be collected to be used, 
So its meaning in the resolution here would be kind of redundant. You don't really need that word. Uh, all biometric data that's used in any way must first be collected. On personal uh, data, not personal information, personal data, I couldn't find a personal, a government definition of personal data, but personally identifiable, inf uh, identifiable information, which is abbreviated PII, is used. Our brief has a definition from the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST 10. This definition includes biometric data like fingerprints, voice signatures, and retinal scans as PII, personally identifiable information. And that seems reasonable because, of course, your biometric information about your body is personal data. Of course. Bio means life. Measure. Uh, metric means measure. So biometric technology measures data about life, aspects of your body, um, your anatomy, and aspects of your body's behavior and movement, called physiology. Jane 08, and Jane is a leader in the field of biometrics who's still publishing research today, says, quote, Jane 08, Biometric recognition, also known as biometrics, refers to the automated recognition of individuals based on their biological and behavioral traits, end quote. We can infer from this that biometric recognition is the same as biometrics. And of course, Torque et al., biometrics have to recognize things, so this equation makes a lot of sense. The biometric technology you're likely most familiar with are fingerprint scanners, like on your phone, eye scanners, both retinal and iris, like on your phone, and facial recognition technology, like Face ID, like on your phone. Your phone probably doesn't have eye scanners, but hey, who knows? However, almost any aspect of your body can identify you when sampling over a large population. So the debate track brief has cards that talk about some of the more wild methods, not just fingerprints and eyes, but um, tongue, knuckles, gait, which means your walking pattern, uh, vein patterns, skeletal patterns, keystroke patterns from keyboard uh, use, ECG patterns from a single heartbeat and even the unique interference your body has on Wi-Fi signals, so you can tell who someone is just by having two Wi-Fi routers around. So, those are the definitions. Uh, a straightforward of this resolution is that all biometrics should be banned. In other words, I would rephrase the resolution like this. The United States federal government should ban biometrics. Under such a ban, these technologies wouldn't have to be thrown out overnight. Uh, there's many things the government has banned in the past, like lead and gasoline, uh, lead paint, pre-1980s in kids' books, for example, uh, PCBs, Kinder Surprise eggs. The government gave varying time frames for eliminating these harmful products, mostly harmful products. Uh, the same could be done for a ban of biometrics. However, the time frame would still have to be reasonable for the debate. I think less than five years to ban a number, you know, you can't just say anyone with a phone is now breaking a law. You'd have to give them some time frame to, you know, change, upgrade, downgrade. Um, but AF, you know, extending the time frame to a 50-year weaning off period would probably be unreasonable for the debate. So, again, here is the simple definition that I will be using for the lecture. The United States federal government should ban biometrics. I would love to present to you in the lecture a reading of the resolution that gives fair ground to both sides. Unfortunately, because there's so many possible readings, the most I can provide is some analysis of each of the words and leave it to you to go with my simple, you know, and I think highly defensible reading uh, or a definition that will maybe make for some fair debates but will necessitate some work on definitions up front in each round. Uh, but before we leave here, I should note, even under my simple reading, AF can definitely win rounds. Uh, a combination of careful case prep an excellent in-round strategy, and adequately scaring the judge should do the quit the trick. I just think it will be difficult. Okay, so this next section will be half me um, complaining about the resolution and half explaining why the resolution is extremely confusing and will be impossible to debate. Feel free to skip complaining if you'd like to, but I mean, maybe it's just more for me. Um, so again, many nuances to how to read the resolution. Um, all four key words, apart from maybe the US federal government, and I'm not even touching the word through, um, are open to interpretation, meaning that there are at least 16 different ways you could interpret the resolution. From my perspective, this makes it a terrible resolution. 
we should be discussing the benefits and harms of biometric technology. It's a fine topic. A, a simple resolution could have worked just fine, but instead many rounds will end up with discussing the meaning of each of these words, leading to a worse experience for everyone. Here are some resolutions, for example, that would have allowed us to discuss the topic without so much ambiguity and with more equal ground. The US federal government should ban the use of biometric technology in public, the use of biometric technology without consent, the use of biometric technology by federal agencies, the use of inferential biometric technology, or classic, the benefits of biometric technology outweigh their harms. I truly regret that you as debaters and I as an event-specific lecturer are subject to the whims of an increasingly, it seems, incompetent committee. I'd love a way out. I'm open to options, but my only option here is to complain. Which, incidentally, I am finished doing now. So, uh, let's talk about these ambiguous terms. First, ban. Does this mean a ban for everyone, including the government, or only private companies? Does it ban individuals from using biometrics as well? The resolution doesn't say, so again, a straightforward reading would mean everyone is banned from using biometrics, uh, including the government itself. The AF team will have to do some definitions work to cut and egg off from the wide impacts of this blanket ban. Next, collection. Does collection actually mean collection? In this straightforward reading where one equals one, all biometric technology will be banned because the technology simply doesn't work without collection. Data must be collected in order to be measured. However, in a world where one equals two, and such a world would give AF a fair chance at winning, I think, uh, collection might mean collection by companies on remote servers. So personal use, like unlocking your phone or car with your fingerprint, would still be allowed. Next, personal data. This particular phrase has no important definition that I could find, but my gut feeling is the authors thought they were referring to personally identifiable information. So under this reading, biometrics could still be used to verify that someone wasn't over a certain age, or that a vehicle operator wasn't drowsy, or any other use that doesn't require you to know the person's name or other information. Uh, tons of biometric applications don't require you to know who the person is. You just say, okay, yeah, this person is over 18, or yeah, this person is awake, something like that. This interpretation is charitable, and again, the only way AF can have reasonable ground. However, that would require saying that biometric data itself, fingerprints, eye scans, DNA, etc., aren't personal data. And of course, that is absurd. Uh, version one of the debate track brief had cards from the biological sciences because biometrics can be used for forest management, livestock management, scan produce for safety. Um, I've since removed these cards because as much as I dislike the resolution, it's a bit ridiculous to at least not stick to humans in this debate. Lastly, biometric recognition technology. It seems like we shouldn't be banning DNA analysis used for solving crimes and disease prevention it also seems like analyzing videos for biometric information like gait patterns or disease state maybe should be allowed. However, these things are actually biometric recognition technology. So again, while AF would be wise to narrow down the set as much as possible, a simple reading would include all biometric technology. We will, um, for your sanity and for mine, skip definitions of should and through and US government, US federal government. Uh, so to reiterate, this topic will be difficult for AF, though hopefully not impossible. Uh, AF teams will need to be very careful in creating definitions that favor them, and NEG will likewise want to push back against these definitions in favor of more simple readings that we will adopt for this lecture. So in other words, the rest of the lecture is really from um, a point of view that biases the NEG, but I think the information will be presented the most clearly this way. If you come up with other definitions, you'll need to interpret these arguments in light of those definitions. So, AF. Biometric recognition technology is already allowing corporations and government entities to encroach on the rights of US citizens by allowing anyone to be personally identified nearly everywhere without a ban on the collection of personal data through biometrics, will continue down a dark path towards an increasingly dystopian future that will strip us of our values of Americans and our dignity as humans. Freedom and values should always be prioritized over mere 
conveniences. We'll begin with, as I see it, Aft's strongest argument. You might imagine a dark sci-fi future a la Black Mirror or Oat Studios where employment, movement, association, freedom of speech um, of every citizen is controlled by the government through technology. In such a scenario, biometric technology is a key tool of control. Without biometrics, this finely tuned technological big brother might not be possible. Some countries are well on their way. China is the best example, with some cities boasting millions of facial recognition cameras, with all social apps in China being indirectly controlled by the government, and with a social credit score system to ensure real penalties when the all-encompassing state apparatus catches you going out of line. But even the U.S., with all our talk of freedoms, is qu quickly sliding down the same path. With such a future before us, with the values that make us free and that make life worth living disappearing, a piecemeal regulation of biometrics is not an option. We need an all-out ban. In the status quo, biometrics are being normalized to the point where there's almost no pushback to the complete biometric takeover of our lives. How many times have you unlocked your phone with your face or your finger just today? Each of us interacts with biometrics dozens of times a day without a second thought. Now, Neg will try to argue that this brings convenience or an awesome sense of security. Here's a response from Balin Fernandez, the famed political author. Quote, From the U.S. to Israel and beyond, the proliferation of invasive and abusive technologies is being swiftly normalized, literally in our faces, under the guise of security and efficiency. As we plunge face-first into biometric dystopia, do not let anyone tell you it is awesome. No. We need to push back, and push back hard. We need to ban these technologies. Who should we fear more? An abuse of government or abuse of multinational corporations? It seems that each one is more terrifying than the other. In the US, corporations are already wantonly collecting and abusing customer biometric data. Sol20 writes about one such case, Clearview AI, a New York startup which was sued several times after a New York Times editorial. Quote, all three lawsuits raise the specter of a dystopian future enabled by Clearview's technology and its seeming disregard for privacy rights. Clearview used AI algorithms to analyze biometric information and generate a biometric template from every image it scraped from the internet. Clearview sold access to the database to law enforcement agencies, private individuals, and companies for commercial gain, allowing purchasers to upload a photograph in order to instantly identify the person and present a dossier of every photo of that person that had been posted online. End quote. Next on corporate abuse, Janice Lopez is an appellate attorney. She writes about how in the status quo there's nothing standing in the way of corporations who wish to continue this abuse. Quote, there's no federal law protecting people from corporations that seek to collect and use personal information for profit. And what this ultimately means is that, that there are no meaningful limits about what private biometric data can be bought and sold without a person's knowledge or consent. End quote. So, what is the solution to stop this abuse and its steady increase? A ban of biometric technology in the U.S. Abusive companies share a bed with abusive states. We see biometric encroachment happening even today all over the world. Borak 23, quote, under the guise of smart city technology, authoritarian and democratic governments have rolled out huge networks of security cameras and used AI to try to ensure there is no place to hide. They go on to give examples from Russia, quote, The system created by Moscow's government, dubbed Safe City, was touted by city officials as a way to streamline its public safety systems. In recent years, however, its 270,000 surveillance cameras designed to catch criminals and terrorists have been turned against pro uh, protesters, political rivals, and journalists. Susan Morrow, a cybersecurity expert, similarly writes about China. Quote, Perhaps one of the most concerning areas of privacy violations associated with facial biometrics is at the state level. The tracking of ethnic minorities in China is an obvious example of how FRT can be misused. Human Rights Watch, HRW, described China's use of FRT as algorithms of suppression. HRW describes how millions of ethnic minorities in China are being held in camps. Their movements are tracked using FRT facial recognition technology. 
the complete biometric control that China, and increasingly Russia, have in place to restrict citizens' movements, speech, association, and other rights, can be expanded to any country. Western countries like the US are certainly no exception. You are not safe just because you live in America. Mohammed Hussein, political analyst, writes, quote, The digital ID aims to compile all of one's documents from birth to death, with every step of life and every achievement in between placed into a single online wallet or through a chip implanted into one's body or hand. Above all, it will undoubtedly make it easier for governments and state actors to track and monitor their citizens. That is certain. If this power falls into the hands of a 21st century Stalin, the result will be the worst totalitarian regime in human history. And we already have a number of applicants for the job of 21st century Stalin. The totalitarian dream may now be achievable, with nations like the US, Canada, Australia, and EU member states setting into motion their own visions of these programs." End quote. And in fact, this terrifying future has already arrived in Europe. EDRI 21 talks about biometric tech abuses in Europe and gives very specific examples from Germany, Austria, Slovenia, the Czech Republic, Italy, Greece, France, Sweden, Serbia, and Denmark. They say that, quote, We're hurtling towards a society that resembles a dystopian sci-fi novel, but the use of these technologies is not inevitable, which is why civil society groups are fighting back to ban biometric mass surveillance before it is too late, end quote. So this totalitarian creep isn't limited to countries like Russia or China. And it can be stopped. And with powerful corporations and powerful individuals' interests aligned, America is almost destined for this biometric hellscape. Let us prevent it before it gets there. Let's ban biometrics. All this talk of a future totalitarian nation state here in America may seem theoretical. Unfortunately, it is all too real. Abortion access is one example of how real it's becoming. Sabin22 writes, quote, The prospect of a world where Roe vs. Wade is overturned has triggered a fresh wave of anxiety about government use of personal data. There are now a wide variety of apps, from period trackers to heart rate monitors, that contain huge amounts of information about your body but aren't protected as medical records. Digital surveillance experts are warning that this seemingly innocuous data could now be weaponized against anyone traveling to an abortion clinic. Right now, this is all a worst-case scenario for privacy advocates. One big reason digital surveillance advocates worry is that Washington policymakers have struggled to pass legislation regulating the sales of Americans' private data. It is up to Congress and state lawmakers to decide whether that's information we want to use against pregnant people in a court of law. End quote. Sabin here is absolutely correct. American women have no protections over the abuse of simple fitness trackers to inform on the state of their own bodies. And until Congress steps in to ban biometric collection, women will, will remain ever more vulnerable to an increasingly totalitarian government. So, what exactly are the rights that biometric recognition technology tramples on? What systems that read your physiology and therefore your thoughts from afar all privacy is erased, free movement, free association, free speech, in extreme cases even freedom of thought. What's more, these freedoms are trampled selectively, with marginalized groups, as always, suffering more. Biometric systems, which often incorporate machine learning, are trained on data sets. And when these data sets are biased, as they almost always are, the biometric systems become biased as well. And even when they're not biased, any minority group will be definitionally underrepresented because they are a minority group and therefore recognized less well by bi biometric systems. So the solution isn't as simple as training on a better data set. Khan and Sanger 21 write about these biases, quote, the many states seeking to stop fraud through surveillance are installing biased systems that may do more harm than good. Predictably, these systems are making mistakes, and when they do, they largely punish BIPOC, trans, and gender non-conforming Americans. To translate into real terms, that means that conveniences like automatic security checks, shopping, or even things as simple as unlocking your phone will be harder for anyone on the social margins, translating into more friction in everyday interactions. But it is not 
just things like skin color and gender categorization that will be biased. Machine learning algorithms can categorize you in a million ways you might not be aware of. Um, people who shop at Walmart, people who drink, people with old cars, people who debate, and a near infinite number of ways that while well represented in algorithms can't easily be tr defined with language. Uh, and biometric systems ca can use these categorizations to give preferential treatment. So in a way, all of us fall victim to the whims of biometric algorithms. Roberts, 22, writes of infer inferential biometric systems, quote, the risk of cultural, ethnic, and gender-based biases is what has led many big tech companies to reconsider developing these systems. These might not be traditionally protected characteristics, such as race and gender. They may not even be legally defined as personal data. However, decisions could still be considered unfair if this algorithmically defined group receives a disproportionately worse outcome than another algorithmic group." End quote. On this bias argument, Neg might retort that some technological solutions exist to biased biometric technologies. However, in a social system that's already biased against many groups like people of color, the poor, short people, ugly people, low IQ people, these systems will just bring about more effective persecution, not less persecution. Here's Fernandez 22, quote, Eliminating technological inaccuracies will do nothing to ameliorate structural injustice. Because when you add a perfect technology to a broken and racist legal system, you only automate that system's flaws and render it a more efficient tool of oppression." End quote. There's no good way for Neg to win on this argument. Dismantling systematic oppression should start with not adding to it. And that means a ban on biometric recognition technology. But even in a world where biometrics helped with bias, they'd still be bad. They help to virtually eliminate privacy for everyone. Again, Roberts 22. Quote, aside from the common privacy risks associated with biometric data collection, such as excessive collection without consent and data insecurity, the type of inference these systems make could also pose a threat to privacy. Many inferential biometrics attempt to understand the inner state of an individual, which could be considered innately private to a person. End quote. Roberts goes on to give an example from North Korea, perhaps history's most oppressive regime, where all citizens, regardless of their feelings, must praise the leader, must make sure that the portrait of him in their house has no dust on it, or, literally in the dust example, face torture, imprisonment, and death. What if North Korea were to implement widespread biometric technology? What if they found out that one of their citizens was angry during this hemming and hawing over the leader, and therefore a traitor to the state. If you think North Korea couldn't get worse, you have to remember that hell has no bottom. Bustamante 22 talks about the slippery slope of these technologies, quote, biometric technologies attempting to detect mental states could escalate from relatively deliberate data gathering for targeted security to a form of total, always on surveillance. This elevated form of surveillance threatens to leave no individual and no particular movement unexamined and thus to severely undermine individuals' right to privacy. So the question is, how close exactly are we willing to get to such a state in America before we do away with these technologies altogether? I, for one, want to stay as far as possible from absolute state control. And that means banning the collection of personal data through biometric technology. Now, AF could have a whole contention about the rights of any group. Uh, children's rights, elderly rights, women's rights, immigrants' rights, etc. But as an example, let's touch on workers' rights. Zhang21 writes about wearable health biometrics that many workplaces distribute for insurance reasons. The healthier you are, the more you exercise, etc., the better your insurance rates. In theory, though, many biometric technologies could be used. Many company devices require biometrics, and many companies require fingerprints or hand scans for security access. In addition, a huge amount of data can be gleaned non-consensually from any cameras that could inform on your health and disease status. Zhang21 writes, quote, Employees need greater legal protections, particularly with employers collecting increasing amounts of biometric information, such as DNA, fingerprints, eye scans, and facial images. Although the U.S. has anti-discrimination laws, these laws fail to protect against misuse of health data. 
Employers that need to reduce their workforce may choose to terminate employees they predict as expensive to insure, regardless of whether those predictions are accurate. HIPAA does not protect employees from third-party companies that collect data in workplace wellness programs, end quote. HIPAA here, they're referring to the law that keeps patient data private, you know, uh, doctor uh, confidentiality that falls under HIPAA, does not apply to your biometric data that third-party companies collect. Biometrics will accelerate the erosion of rights, and that erosion is coming for all of us, regardless of how removed you may feel from the dystopia we're describing here. Thankfully, there is a solution, a complete ban, once and for all, on the use of these technologies in the U.S. This section deals with AF defense rather than offense. One of Neg's key arguments will be that the safe and secure, uh, will be about the safe and secure world that biometric technology is helping to build. Although the gross violation of Americans' rights and the pending prospect of a complete totalitarian state outweigh any of Neg's arguments enough that this debate is nearly absurd, uh, even these security arguments won't hold any weight. Biometrics really aren't any better than passwords. Instead, they are deeply vulnerable to attacks. First, spoofing or presentation attacks happen when someone pretends to be someone they're not by presenting a biometric system with false information, either to pretend I'm not me or to pretend I am someone else, or both. Jane et al. 21 writes about the future of, researcher, uh, of researchers to prevent, uh, the failure of researchers to prevent uh, these attacks on biometric systems. And Jane, again, by the way, uh, professor, researcher at Michigan State University, probably the most legit biometrics experts in our whole brief, quote, PAs, presentation attacks, have gained notoriety due to several real-world examples where they have been shown to fool biometric recognition systems. The continued success of spoofing modern-day biometric recognition systems is not a consequence of a lack of research into developing presentation attack detection systems, end quote. So the systems that researchers have tried to build in order to make these attacks impossible are just failing. A couple examples of these kinds of spoofing attacks. Uh, first, deepfakes. Weiss, Weiss, 22, writes about a cybersecurity firm that tested the top 10 liveliness detection systems. That's a technology that claims to ensure a real person is being scanned rather than, than an image or a video. This firm found that fully 9 out of the 10 systems were vulnerable to deepfake attacks, where a hyper-realistic fake video is presented to a facial recognition system instead of an actual face. But it's not just facial recognition systems that are easily fooled. Even the simple fingerprint scanner has a well-known vector of attack. Newman 10, a bit old, but checks out, quote, NYU researchers explored master prints by manually identifying various features and characteristics that could combine to make a fingerprint that authenticates multiple people. Overall, the master prints got 30 times more matches than the average real fingerprint, even at the highest security settings, end quote. The impact of more biometrics is more security vulnerabilities. The more we use, the more insecure we all become. Here, Mugga and Walton, 21, on Smart Cities, quote, As cities become ever more connected, the risks of digital harm by malign actors grow exponentially. Cities are therefore entirely unprepared for the coming digital revolution. One of the paradox of a, paradoxes of a hyper-connected world is that the smarter a city gets, the more exposed it becomes to a widening array of digital threats. End quote. When these cities depend more and more on foolable biometric technologies, dangers to these cities grow in kind. So in short, Neg will claim that biometrics make the world safer or more secure. But in fact, these systems are easily fooled, and as they become widely used, their threat to society grows in harm. A federal ban would prevent these systems from posing an attack as attack vectors and wreaking harm on American security systems. Last, let's talk about bans specifically. There is both precedent and a large demand for stopping the forward march of this devilish technology. Congress would truly be doing the right thing by stopping its use in America. Amnesty International has called for a ban of facial recognition technologies. Facial recognition as a subset of biometrics is important because you can use it without consent by just pointing a camera at someone and because this technology is already very widespread. 
Here is a quote from Amnesty International 21. Amnesty International and partners, including Human Rights Watch, have joined forces in an open letter that calls for an outright ban on uses of facial recognition and remote biometric recognition technologies that enable mass surveillance, end quote. These proposed changes are already happening in Europe. Gojard 22 talks about a proposal from the EU Parliament, quote, Should the EU ban software that can pick a face out of a crowd? A growing political coalition thinks so and just received heavyweight support from the third largest group in the EU Parliament, where a majority is now in favor of banning facial recognition tech that scans crowds indiscriminately and in real time, end quote. And Burgess 21 talks about a similar proposal from the European Data Protection Board, quote, The European Data Protection Supervisor and the European Data Protection Board have called for a total ban on using AI to automatically recognize people, end quote. And in fact, these are not just proposals. These bans are already being put in place. Friend 22, quote, Biometric facial scans, which were widely deployed as a security measure at the 2020 Beijing Winter Olympics, will be prohibited at the 2024 Summer Olympics and Paralympics in Paris due to French privacy law, end quote. If the European countries whose human rights and quality of life records are looked up to around the world can ban the technologies that rob their people of dignity, privacy, and human rights, isn't it time the U.S. should do the same thing? Thankfully, we are already on the right track. Here's Sherd and Schwartz 22, quote, Communities across the country are fighting back. In the three years since San Francisco passed its first-of-a-kind ban on government use of facial recognition, at least 16 more municipalities, from Oakland to Boston, have followed their lead. These local bans are necessary to protect residents from harms that are inseparable from municipal use of this dangerous technology. End quote. These are the early days of municipal bans. You can think of this period in legal history like the early days of allowances for gay marriage or for legal marijuana or for outlawing lead and gasoline. Our nation needs to get ahead of the march for human rights and ban biometrics on a national level. Who said AF would be harder? Can Neg really compete with this dystopian horror movie arguments? I don't think so. Let's watch them try, though. A total ban on the collection of personal data through biometrics would be an absurd overreach of government power, producing immense harm and risk with few benefits. Biometrics allow for safe and secure identification of individuals, giving us a far more efficient world that's safe from the increasing onslaught of cyber attacks and identity theft. The benefits to individuals, to society, and companies are far too great for a blanket ban on these technologies that are improving our lives every day. Let's reflect for a moment on the apparent absurdity of the AF position. In their world, our phones, with their face ID and fingerprint scanners, become illegal. Our computers, with touch ID, become illegal. Any smart doorknobs, smart car locks, smart gun locks, illegal. These will be replaced by less secure, less reliable passwords and passcodes that we'll have to write down or remember, or more likely than not, just forget, leaving America's locks unusable or highly insecure. Let's also imagine AF's nightmare world. What if all door locks and all car locks, all parking garage key cards and all work badges were replaced with biometric fingerprint scanners. Would that world be worse than the world we have now? Or would it simply be more secure and more convenient? So, phones. We use biometrics for high levels of security on even the lowest tier phones. This widespread acceptance has made customers trust and accept biometrics as a preferred form of verification, with the vast majority ready to provide biometrics for widespread online verification. Here is Security Magazine 22, quote, Biometric access control and facial authentication have become increasingly ubiquitous in daily life, with 55% of consumers using a biometric authentication factor, such as a fingerprint or face scan, to unlock their mobile phones. 72% of respondents said they would prefer to use face verification uh, for secure online transactions, end quote. This gap between the status quo and customer appetite shows how far the, ver the biometric verification industry has to grow in increasing security and growing the economy. 
Facial scans can also be used at airports to provide faster processing, more accurate identification, and more secure transportation systems. The same poll from Security Magazine 22 also talks about airport security, showing again that the vast majority of consumers prefer biometric identification, even showing a huge satisfaction rate in their usage. Quote, Three quarters of air travelers say they would prefer using biometric data instead of passports and boarding passes while traveling through airport security and gates. Over a third have already experienced using biometric identification in their travels with an 88% satisfaction rate, end quote. And again, this shows a huge appetite and a strong record of success in using biometrics for even higher stakes verification. As more stores continue to roll out biometric scanners like Amazon One, the contactless palm reader, shoppers continue to use and enjoy the safety, security, and convenience of these machines. In addition to pure convenience, biometrics can provide more equity to shopping experiences. Roberts22 writes about facial verification for alcohol purchases in the UK, quote, A potential benefit of biometrics is the increased convenience they could bring about to everyday life of individuals and improved efficiency for businesses. It would also act as an equalizer for the 24% of UK adults who are over the age of 18, but who do not have a photographic ID, end quote. Lastly, the major hard impact of consumer side biometrics, money. Adams 22 reports that consumer biometrics will reach $11 billion by 2027. Report Linker 22 shows a rise in the voice and speech recognition industry to 20.7 billion by 2026. And Bert 20 says that the digital identity market will generate $53 billion a year for vendors by 2026, according to recent forecasts, as the use of digital ID apps soars. These enormous numbers reflect market demand. If customers didn't see the extreme value in biometric verification, including safety, security, convenience, these market rises would be inexplicable. Where are they coming from? For anyone that believes in the free market, who believes in individual choice, and who values economic growth, biometrics should be seen as a huge win for humanity. I love this argument, convenience, especially for lay judges, because it is hard to imagine how unlocking your phone with your finger could really bring civilization to its knees, which half really needs to be arguing. Uh, again, recall on topicality that if Neg wants to prove convenience arguments aren't topical, they have to prove either that one, biometric data isn't personal data, or two, that biometric devices can work somehow without a collection mechanism, or of course, that collection doesn't mean collection, although most of the convenience arguments still apply here. Um, I would be impressed by teams that manage to make some of those arguments. Biometrics also gives us information about people that we can use to provide better services. Again, you could probably make arguments for infants, the elderly, and other vulnerable groups, but we'll touch here on just two groups that deserve our attention, students and patients. Student engagement is a top reason that classes fail or succeed. An interested, curious, and intrinsically motivated student is very likely to do well, and a bored and disengaged student likely won't. Certain uh, educational interventions can help with this. However, learning which interventions work and which don't on which students, on which classes, can take teachers a whole career to figure out. We need a faster system. This need is doubly true in remote learning, where body language feedback isn't available to instructors, or in asynchronous learning, where a teacher may not be present at all. With biometrics, we finally have a way to measure, and therefore improve, this engagement in real time. Roberts 22 details how biometrics can help, quote, Educational recognition has been proposed as a way to improve educational outcomes. In particular, it has been suggested that inferential biometrics hold the potential for improving e-learning platforms to ensure that the educational experience is more engaging and effective." End quote. The impacts are better grades, more societal contributions, better jobs, and overall better lives for students whose education is helped by biometrics. Given that biometrics are intrinsically about biology, their application to the medical field should come as no surprise. First, diagnostics. A study by Russo et al. 21 found that biometrics can help to identify breast cancer with 97.8% accuracy solely through the sweat from a fingertip. Much better than the invasive and embarrassing diagnostic te techniques that mostly exist today. In COVID, McDonald 21 says, quote, 
Smartwatches and other wearable uh, measuring biometrics like heart rate variability have the ability to detect if a person is COVID-19 positive, even before the symptoms appear. The technology used by them could go a long way in helping check the spread of the pandemic as well as other diseases that are transmissible, end quote. The Aura Ring is a great example, given to NBA players to detect COVID uh, early on in the pandemic. So, look, COVID is in our, on our minds, but the threat from future pandemics or really any transmissible diseases can be greatly reduced through the use of biometric tech. For hospital patients, biometrics can also be a tool to directly save lives. Patient misidentification in hospitals, leading to wrong medication, wrong dosages, wrong diet, wrong diagnostics, leads to millions of deaths worldwide each year. In the U.S., medical errors lead to more than 250,000 deaths each year. It's John Hopkins 16. Many of those related to patient misidentification. 250,000 deaths. A study by Sonadol 20 shows that fingerprints can be used for patient identification with zero false positives reported in this study. And a 97% positive ID rate, those 3% margin are probably due to user error, uh, not technological error. Implementing these technologies could prevent many thousands of deaths across the U.S. each year. Lastly, patients who are so sick or so disabled that they can't communicate with the outside world about their own mind, um, or outside the own mind, their own mind, about their pain levels. Here again is Roberts, 22. Quote, facial analysis systems that seek to identify signs of pain may prove to be fruitful avenues for augmenting care and providing improved outcomes, end quote. If you want to tug at a judge's heartstrings, this pain management uh, argument could be very strong. So, in summary, the app side is looking to completely ban technology that can improve student outcomes, accurately diagnose disease, and patient misidentification, help patients with uncommunicable pain. You can trade vague ideas about the future. Uh, you can't trade vague ideas about the future just based on feeling uncomfortable about this new technology with real, concrete, life-saving applications in the present. Okay. Next, we'll look at two um, related but separate benefits of biometric. In fact, these are the key stock arguments for NEG, security and safety. Security deals with keeping private things private, like your passwords, your money, military secrets. Biometric says locks are far more effective than other technologies like keys and passwords, and they are already widely used to keep things and information safe. Safety is a broader concept. Identification of individuals in certain areas, along with their expressions and behaviors, can help to prevent and stop crime, and to make operation of large machines less dangerous. Almost Every highly secure authorization system in the world, including highly secure installations guarding scientific and military secrets and dangers, require biometric authorization. With modern attack vectors like quantum hacking technology, this protection layer is crucial, and with a ban, digital security in the U.S. would essentially evaporate. Biometrics can act as more secure and convenient passwords, with far less vectors for attack. Sing 21, quote, Biometric credentials are becoming popular in all concern areas as a mode of authenticating due to the broad range advantages with comparison to traditional authentication methods. There are two conventional ways of identifying individuals. The first one is knowledge-based. The second method is token-based. Both ways are insecure, as passwords can be forgotten or guessed by others. And in other, the other case, badge ID or other identification may be lost or stolen. Biometric attributes are an optimal solution." End quote. Ritter21 has a very quotable line about the advantages of biometrics. I hope to hear it in many cases. Quote, That brings us to something we are. Dr. Seuss's adage that there is no one alive who is youer than you is wise in many ways and also highlights why biometrics are so powerful. End quote. The impact of a password replacement is uh, an enormous cost in terms of time and money on businesses or on individuals who have their passwords stolen along with the accompanying psychological and social distress that it adds onto companies and people. So passwords are a thing of the past. We need something new. That is biometrics. Here's an impact. Silva 21, quote, At a time when a staggering 15 billion sets of stolen usernames and passwords are circulating in the dark web, behavioral biometric analysis promises to replace systems relying on personally identifiable information, end quote. I should note that most of these arguments 
will hold even with quote unquote reasonable um, definitions of the resolution that give equal ground to both sides because these security and secrecy things do necessitate uh, user information stored on some server somewhere. And usually they're controlled by some companies that aren't internal company servers. So in most cases, these arguments will still hold anyway. Uh, let's talk about zero trust. Zero trust authorization systems are being implemented more and more across the nation. In these systems, no user or network is trusted and authorization must be constantly reapproved for access to the system. Under such a system, biometrics become indispensable for usability. Otherwise, users might have to re-enter credentials many, many, many times throughout a session. That's not a very good user experience. Biometrics are better. Lazuni22, quote, If you and your security team are concerned about convenience and access, there's an obvious solution, biometrics. Even if an employee gave away their credentials, someone else couldn't access their systems. Biometric integration into zero trust is also incredibly convenient, end quote. Biometric security can enable IoT devices like phones, computers, TVs, along with smart appliances, smart cars, smart clothes, etc., and any other connected devices to operate securely. Yang et al., 21, quote, Biometrics offers an interesting window of opportunity to improve the usability and security of IoT and can play a significant role in securing a wide range of emerging IoT devices to address security challenges, end quote. Neg through this argument, it gains access to IoT impacts because without biometrics, it may be impossible for those network devices to be both usable and also secure. Here's some real meaty ones. Highly secure research institutions also use biometrics as authorization levels. Banning biometrics and removing them from institutions in the U.S. would, at minimum, cause these institutions to become much more vulnerable to intrusion, attack, and theft of dangerous technologies. Kolombowski 20 talks about fingerprint scanners as common devices in labs that research dangerous pathogens, certified by the National Institutes of Health. And um, Beglin Stiehuysen 12 give an example, quote, to reach his office in Galveston National Laboratory, where scientists study deadly pathogens such as Ebola and Marburg viruses, Director James LeDuc wipes his keycard at the building's single entrance, which is guarded 24-7 by Texas State Police. Entering a research lab requires another card swipe, and for labs housing especially dangerous microbes, a fingerprint scan. End quote. I think any judge will agree that keeping Ebola viruses locked behind biometric authorization layers is a good thing. Last on security. Military installations. These installations house top secret military information, um, our country's ICBMs, nuclear weapons, possibly aliens, and should probably have more security than your average door lock. The Defense Biometric Identification System is used across the US military for personal identification. Zoenberg 20 talks about the many uses of biometrics in the military, which also includes scans at checkpoints and identification of friendlies, as well as non-friendlies. Banning biometrics and removing them from military installations would lead to gaping holes in our country's national security. The judge here obviously can't consider voting for such a proposition, just insecure military installations everywhere. That sounds kind of bad to me. Okay, so if security deals with high magnitude impacts like Ebola spreading around the world, safety will deal with high probability impacts, which are those that might affect American citizens every day, you know, in one form or another. So crime. Biometric identification through DNA analysis has been used for decades. Fingerprinting criminals and using those fingerprints to solve crimes would also be outlawed. A ban on these technologies would push law enforcement back to the proverbial Stone Age, where wrongful conviction and incarceration were much more common than they are today. I don't even have a card for this. It's just such a glaring hole in the resolution that I feel you might be able to win some debate rounds on an argument like this without even resorting to evidence. Biometrics also help to prevent terrorism. Husti Orban and Olayin 20, quote, Biometric tools and data can constitute a powerful instrument in the prevention and countering of terrorism and violent extremism by facilitating efficient and targeted responses to threats. 
This is also referred to in the regulatory efforts by the United Nations Security Council, requiring that states develop and implement systems to collect biometric data in order to responsibly and properly identify terrorists, including foreign terrorist fighters, unquote. And if you don't trust uh, the U.S. and the United Nations, here is Interpol, quote, Frontline officers need direct access to terrorism, terrorism related data in order to detect and positively identify members of transnational terrorist groups. Biometric data, such as facial images and fingerprints, can lead to the accurate identification of individuals using a false identity, thereby improving efforts to locate terrorists and carry out successful investigations and prosecutions. End quote. Arguments tying into bioterrorism and the aforementioned lab security. Uh, bio, yeah, bioterrorism and lab security, or nuclear terrorism and the aforementioned military security will be some of the truly powerful arguments of biometrics rounds. And cars. Biometrics already present in many cars can help to avoid traffic accidents and deaths. Here's Roberts 22 again, the real star of this lecture, with some impacts on car safety. Quote, the European Commission specified that new vehicles should include drowsiness and distraction detection. This measure is expected to save more than 25,000 lives and help prevent at least 140,000 severe injuries by 2038. This feature of new vehicles will almost certainly be reliant on inferential biometric technology. That is 25,000 lives and 140,000 severe injuries in Europe alone. Some mathematical extrapolation to the US might be able to provide similar numbers. While the US has a smaller population, it actually has more cars than Europe, so the number may be comparable. Lastly, on safety, factories. Abate 22, quote, Unfortunately, work accidents are still very common, resulting in human losses and permanent injuries. It is possible to guarantee drowsiness protection, detection and liveliness detection. It is possible to significantly improve the safety of operators, avoiding fatal accidents for them. End quote. Preventing workplace injuries and deaths could be a key impact of an argument about improving the lives of workers or safety in general. Okay, we now have more than enough reason to negate a ban on biometric recognition technology, but that doesn't mean NEG approves the unfettered proliferation of biometrics without regard to their overreach, potentials for abuse, safety issues. Instead, we should treat biometrics like anything else with good and bad sides. We should regulate them. Much like we, re we regulate cars and drugs and pollution, we might consider regulation of biometrics rather than an outright ban. Two reasons for this. First, not all biometric systems are equally dangerous. Yet again, Roberts 22, quote, not all infer inferential biometric systems carry the same level of risk. With the right data collection and processing limitations, developments such as affect-aware gaming can enhance users' gaming experience while carrying low risk for users. Proposals to ban emotion recognition systems appear disproportionate when applied to developments such as these. A nuanced approach to governance is needed." End quote. Uh, polling data, which we touched on earlier, also shows the same thing. Users trust some groups like law enforcement over other groups like marketers, so they'd be okay with giving up biometric data in some cases and not okay in others. So that's first. Not everything has the same risk profile. Second, the federal bans uh, in the United States are almost never preferred. Our state system allows us 50 petri dishes in which to experiment with different laws. Crawford 19, this is a long quote, but a good one, and the last of the lecture, so... Listen up, quote, the potential benefits of facial recognition and biometric data generally are just too great for governments and corporations to pass up. Existing bans of public sector use that are based on its present inaccurate and discriminatory implementations likely won't be sustainable long term as the technology improves. At the same time, completely unfettered use of bio private biometric systems seems incompatible with American values. When federal policy is absent, local governments can act as testing grounds for new ideas, providing proof that the status quo can change. This is not a new idea. As Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis wrote in 1932, a state may, if its citizens choose, serve as a laboratory and try novel social and economic experiments without risk to the rest of the country. That approach of using local laws as laboratory trials worked when it came to spreading the power grid across the country. States and localities led the way in making uh, electricity a publicly governed utility. The same thing happened in healthcare. The patchwork and work for tech, too." End quote. The 
anti-ban argument can make for a great second or third contention in the case, even just a short contention, as you can use it to win no matter how the clash over biometrics itself goes. Even if AF proves that biometrics are disastrous, and even if you totally agree that they're disastrous, you can still win on a ban being the wrong move. Okay, thank you for joining me in today's lecture. I hope you've learned something today. Please leave a comment and or a like and or subscribe, or at the very least, please just be kind to those around you today and forever. Remember to let me know what style of art you want to see in the next topic, and I will see you then for the top final topic of the school year. Much love to all of you. Goodbye.